Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Ooh, boy, everybody sounds good this morning. I think your, your sermon all week, Pastor, got them all riled up. All right. Well, first of all, I want to welcome everybody here this morning. Amen. Amen. It's a go, so good to be in the house of the Lord on the Sabbath day, isn't it? Yes. But we have a few announcements here. Uh, first of all, we got our international potluck coming up November the 25th. And there is a sign-up sheet for that. You know that, right? A lot of people don't know that, but there's a sign-up sheet. And you can, you know, you can share your story or even sing a song about what you're going to bring. All right. <laughs> the only problem about that, I'm going to miss that. Don't like that, but with family out in and out of town, so. And then we also got our new pictorial church directory. That's going to be on December the 11th and December the 12th. You know, and uh, that is for everyone. That's not just for church members. That's for family. You can even bring a pet. Amen. Hey, my pet is my family. You know, but I'm not bringing because my wife wouldn't come into church then. So, but you can. But it's for everyone. It's not just for church members. It's for everyone. So we wanted to make that clear. Also, our Christmas program is December the 16th. So it's time for sign-ups. For anybody who want to be a part of that program, you sign up with Lisa because the program is on December the 16th. So you can sign up with Lisa now if you want to be a part of that program. Then we also have caroling on December the 9th at 4 p.m. Anybody like to go out caroling? Come on. I'm the only one? One. I haven't went out in a long time, but I would like to do that. All right, and then uh, I think that's pretty much all for me. Did I miss anything? I know we got some more announcements. So okay, go ahead. We'll let. I'm losing names now. Lee. Lee, come up. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. Good, morning. Good morning. I have an announcement about the Thanksgiving baskets we're going to give out tomorrow morning. Um, I was told this morning that those baskets have already been put together by a few members who were down at the food pantry and the closet working. So uh, first of all, I want to thank them for doing that for us. And second, the pastor, I think that we can meet at 930 instead of 9, so on a Sunday morning, that's pretty good. So we meet at 9.30, and um, we have about 30 or 35 baskets to give out. I have divided them up according to zip code. So if you come, you're going to have about three names in each area and each zip code, so you won't have to go very far apart. So if you would like to come out tomorrow morning at 9.30, and help us deliver baskets, we would appreciate it. Thank you. Well, I um, don't know where, oh, okay, sorry. Okay, so, sorry, kind of zoned out there. I didn't know where Mother Half went here because I'm not really supposed to be doing this announcement, but I was nominated to do this announcement. Last week, you know, I got up here to make this announcement for Women's Ministries Tea, right? Okay, so I'm back up here. So that means how many are going to be at this tea? Every woman is going to be at this tea, right? If I have to make an announcement, you have to be at the tea, correct? Correct. Okay, so I think there's some women in the audience that have this announcement. They're going to be passing this out to every woman in the audience. So y'all can pass that out right quick. Pass that out right, right quick. Hurry, 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 hurry. We have, we have limited time, limited time. So on this, it's two pieces. One piece says, yes, I will be attending. Um, you need to put your name on that. We really just need to count so we know how much food to make. And yes, I will be attending. I know there's one that says, I'm not attending. Just ignore that because I forgot to take that off. Yes, I will be attending. <laughs> On um, the other side, just cut it in half. The other side, keep so you'll know when and where it's going to be happening. Three o'clock, you know, in the youth room down there that we're using now. We're going to start using it for all kinds of things, I think. 
But yes, I will be attending. Just ignore the I won't be attending thing, you know. So, so um, make sure every woman gets one of these. And yes, we will be attending, correct? Correct? Yes. Three o'clock in the afternoon. Who has anything to do at three o'clock on a Sunday afternoon? Nobody has anything to do at three o'clock on a Sunday afternoon, right? Right? Nobody. So see, you can attend. Three o'clock on a Sunday afternoon, you can attend at three o'clock Sunday afternoon. If I can attend, you can attend, right? Yes. Yes. Yes, if you want to bring someone, yes, get some more of these. It's just for account purpose, really, so we know how much food to have, plates, um, table settings, all of that type thing. You know, so if you need some extra ones of these, yes, just ask them for extra ones. That's all it is, is just a count type thing, okay? That's all it is, is to count, okay? Thank you very much. Okay. Everybody's got an announcement. Pastor, let me, let me interrupt here a minute. Oh, you're not a female. You can't go. I forgot. I really like tea, though. Oh, okay. Lay down. Uh, all those that normally uh, attend our Wednesday night uh, Bible study class, it'll be canceled uh, since it's the day before uh, Thanksgiving. Thank you. Very good. All right. So I just have a few things real quick. Um, Let's start with the uh, elders. Our meeting is going to be Tuesday, if that's okay, because I don't need that. I'll hold on to it. Uh, our meeting is going to be Tuesday because my brother's coming in town on Monday. So I'd like to do it on Tuesday. Uh, we have a program this afternoon at 2 o'clock. I may show you a small clip of what we're going to do. It's a three and a half minute clip, but I'll show it at the end of the sermon and show you what this documentary is about. It's called Beware of Angels. It's quite interesting. All right. Uh, when we do our caroling, you know, I, I get a lot of stuff from the uh, food bank. And in that stuff, we get a lot of little trinkets like this and this. And we're getting a lot of it, but I still need some more. So I'd like you to go to the dollar store and buy a bunch of stuff like this. You know, just little toys for boys, little toys for girls and boys, whichever. And then we're going to stuff a couple of them in these little bags that I have. I only have a 1,000 of them, so... You know, I don't know if we have enough, but I want to be able to stuff these. And then as we go around, we'll have, oh, they usually have a little tag, but uh, we'll go caroling. If they have kids that are like 15 and under, I would like to give each one of the children a little bag. As well as when we're caroling, as like a little Thanksgiving, you know, Christmas gift. And we can put our card in there to advertising the church. So I would like to do that if that's okay. We have potluck today because of the program. I love Paula too, right? Who can't love food? And then, well, there's something really special today. It's incredible how, how, how things just work out perfectly, isn't it? God is good, isn't he? Amen. But we have a special day today. And that day is that Geraldine is turning 90 today. Amen. Well, I would like Geraldine to stand up and we're going to sing happy birthday to her today. <laughs> Because we all like to embarrass people, right? <laughs> so let's sing. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Hey. God is good, and uh, Geraldine, I hope we get another 90 years. <laughs> God, well, thank you, Thomas. Is there a mission statement today? Yes. The first time when I met him, when I, I was study in junior high school, but uh, there a moment he didn't study uh, Bible. His attitude's not so good. I won't always fight. I was angry with people, with my friends. But when I I study Bible, so I'm very inspired, and I try to change a little bit my life. And I I thank God because God helped me, and then I decide to baptize. And I became a Seventh-day Adventist. 
After Mariano's conversion, he couldn't keep the things he had learned to himself. Any chance he found, he would get closer to his classmates and share the gospel. When teachers didn't show up for class, Mariano would seize the opportunity and tutor fellow classmates, pairing each subject with Bible themes. Many of the students listened with interest to his words. Lola, one of Mariano's classmates, listened quietly. She didn't seem interested, but she was actually deeply moved and grew more curious with each lesson. One day, Lola called Mariano over to teach her about the Bible. She had so many questions. The two started spending time together to learn more, and as a result, their faith grew. During this time, some of Mariano's friends decided to get baptized, but unfortunately, their families weren't happy and threatened them to keep them from joining the Adventist church. Lola also faced opposition, but her family members changed their minds when they saw such a positive change in her life. The two friends were convinced of the importance of keeping the Sabbath day as commanded in the Bible. We would always go to church on Saturday. We never attend class uh, at the school. So the teacher, they decided together and they drove about us. Then we, we watched and they stopped us to study there. Their situation was critical and not many people were there to support them. Pastor Ignacio was one of the few friends who took the time to listen, counsel, and pray for their situation. It was only after much prayer and God's clear intervention that Mariano and Lola found a school that would allow them to take Sabbath off to attend church. For this, the young students had to leave family and friends and move to the capital city of Dili in Timor-Leste. Today, Mariano and Lola have graduated, and in gratitude to God, they have chosen to give one year of their lives to do mission work in the cities. I really like, like the compassion activity and also community service because through it, we can have a more friends, <laughs> we can close to many people, and easy for us to share God's love today. Please pray for Mariano, Lola, and the new friends they will make in Timor-Leste. Seventh-day Adventists are a distinct minority in this country, but as mission work unfolds here, God can send more workers to His mission field. Please stand.
Jesus, thank you for this day, and thank you for the, all the people who came to church today. And for the people who didn't make it, we'll come next Sabbath. Amen. Now it's time for our children's story. At this time, let's just hold your dollar bills up high. You can hold up some of those hundreds, too. We won't complain. Amen. <laughs> Yes, and as you children, and you, as you collect the, the dollar bills, would you please say thank you? We have lots of time, so take your time coming. Yeah. Oh, he says, I don't know where I want to go. Those girls are not. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Looky right here. Can you put it right there? Can you put it to me? Oh, thank you. Oh, boy, he's a big boy. You want to sit down right there on that? You want to sit right here? You want to sit right here? He says, no, but I'll go play a while. <laughs> Isn't it fun to have little ones? It makes a joyful noise in the church. Yes. This morning I'm going to tell you a story. How many like Christmas? I do too. I like to decorate. I mean, put some candles out and put some greenery out. And, and we still put a Christmas tree up in our house. Now, we've been doing this. My mother started this tradition, and it still goes on today, uh, what we do at Christmas. Now, we don't have big Christmas dinner. We don't do that. We barbecue. If it's snowing coming down, I stand in the snow and the snow comes down. It doesn't bother me. And we barbecue. Oh, I have to get closer. I'm sorry. And, uh, <laughs> and we have a good time. But I want to tell you a story about Charles. Uh, Charles, he, he liked Christmas, but he wasn't looking forward to Christmas. And so everybody was around, and they said, oh, guess what? We got our tree up, and we got some lights up. And Charles said, oh, really? And they said, oh, yeah, yeah. And they'd go on, and they'd play a while, and they'd do some things. And it was like December the 12th, and people were talking about, oh, how pretty the lights were in town. Or you go to the mall, and look at all the lights. Or you drive down the street, and how pretty it looked. Why couldn't it look like this all the time? Everybody felt so good. But Charles didn't feel very good. Now, Charles was 10 years old, and he wasn't interested in that at all. And so no, the boys and girls couldn't figure out why he didn't like Christmas. Well, see, Charles had a mom and a dad. Mom worked all the time, and guess what dad did? He didn't work very much. But he sure did like the little restaurant down the street where he could get something to drink any time he wanted it. And so mom would lose money out of her purse. And she didn't have money to buy sometimes groceries. And she had told Charles, said, this year, Charles, I don't think we're going to have, we can't get a Christmas tree. Uh, we can't afford that this year. And he says, well, how come Dad can always go down to that place right down there every day? And she says, uh, and why don't he work like you work? And she says, well, he can't keep a job. And she, sa he, sa she says, well, why does he live here with us then? 
And he said, she said, well, he's your daddy. He said, he doesn't do anything with me. And said, he, he, as soon as you come home, he runs to your purse and out the door he goes. And she says, I know, I know, Charles, but, you know, things are kind of hard this year. So he already knew last year was hard. This year's going to be hard. And he didn't get anything last year for Christmas. And he said, well, will I get anything this year for Christmas? And she says, I don't know, Charles. I'll have to think about that. Well, Mom met a lady at her work, and, and she was telling about they were going to give out some baskets and, and, uh, and some toys and things, and, and she knew what was going on in the house. And she said, how would Charles like to have some toys, and how would you like to have a basket? Now, what are we doing tomorrow? We're handing out baskets for Thanksgiving, right? for people that need some little help. Well, this lady went to church and she got the up together and said, this is what we need at this house. And then she said to her, why don't every day, every time you get paid, you take so much money and you put it back and you put it in your drawer at work instead of taking it home. And your husband will think you're not making the money that you were making before. She said, I hadn't thought about doing that. So her next paycheck, that's exactly what she did. She got home, he went to the purse, and there wasn't hardly any money in it. And he said, uh, uh, did you lose your job? And she says, no, I didn't lose my job. I still have a job, but I'm not getting as much money to bring home. Now, she didn't say that they didn't give her her paycheck. She just said, I'm not getting as much money to bring home. So she didn't tell the story. She left it at school, at work. And so he said, well... I need at least $5. And she said, I'm sorry, but you can't have $5 out of my purse this time. He said, she said, you better find a job or you're going to have to move out. And Charles was in the bedroom and he could hear. And he says, oh boy, we're going to get rid of that. And so <laughs> then he comes out and he says, uh, mom, I'm so happy that, that dad didn't get money out of your purse. Well, dad heard him. And he says, I'm so glad you're going to get rid of Dad because all he does is run down at that place and just drinks all the time and spends the money, and then we don't have anything. Now, how many of that happens to you? Not too many people that happens to anymore. But, you know, Mom found out that if she started praying about things, things would change. And sure enough, they did. Dad moved out, and everything went real smooth. And the lady brought the basket and brought toys. And Charles was so excited because Dad was gone. Everything was wonderful. They didn't have a tree. But the next year, guess what happened? They had the tree. And, he, and Mom bought the pack, pack presents for him. And she didn't have to have a food basket this time because Dad was gone. And sometimes that happens, doesn't it? But Charles, after he got a little older, he got to thinking, Maybe we shouldn't have had Dad to leave. What is Dad doing now? But you know what Dad did? He got a job. He had to pay for his own stuff. He got a job. And sometimes Jesus works miracles today, doesn't he? And he got a job. So think about that. Are we selfish with what we have, or do we share with what we have? And we want to share, don't we? Okay, you can find your seats. <laughs> part of our service now when we give back to God what he has bestowed unto us. It's for our local church budget today. Since 1810, the city of Newark, Germany had celebrated, celebrated Oktoberfest every year from mid or late September to the first week of October. According to the tradition, the king began the celebration when, in when inviting the citizens of Newark to attend his wedding. For about 16 days, the inhabitants would spend their nights and most days on the fairground eating, listening to music, and drinking lots of beer. The Seventh-day Adventist Church in Germany celebrated a Harvest Day as a counterculture response to October 1st. Churches decorated their platforms with bread, cheese, and produce from their gardens. Believers thanked God for providing for their substance. What a great opportunity to praise God. 
from whom all blessings flow. Bringing offerings to the offerings is one to the altar is one great way to thank God for His providence. Helping someone is in need is another way. Thanking Thanksgiving should move believers deeply. Oh, I need new glasses. <laughs> What a great opportunity in this season of Thanksgiving to adopt a person, a family, or even a community. Blessing them with the words of encouragement, acts of kindness, and gifts of appreciation. May every believer, family, or group reflect on ways God's love can incarnate through their actions. And may this church receive a generous offering to, com to continue the proclamation of the three angels' message in this community. Will the deacons please rise? Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful for all that you have given unto us, Lord, but we know that we can do more with what you bestow with us, Lord, as we give an offering, Lord, bless those who give and those who are unable to give, but Lord, continue to use it for the ministry and to help the communities and others who are in need. We're just so thankful for all you do in Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> with us as we sing songs of thanksgiving.
time for our congregational prayer. If you have any prayer requests that you have written, you can bring them forward at this time and place them in my Bible. Also, if there's no written request, but you have them on your heart, we all can, so can come forward and lay them at the feet of Jesus. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that we're in your house on this beautiful Saturday. Lord, we come here for you, not just for ourselves, but because you deserve our praise and our worship. 
You deserve everything you have done for us because, Lord, we haven't been the best example at times for you, but you've always been the great example for us, and we're just so thankful. Lord, as we, as we worship here today, we let your Holy Spirit fill this place, preparing each and every heart for the word that must, that's coming forth today. Lord, you also know what the prayer requests were that was written. You know the desires of the hearts of the people and what they're re are requesting from you. But Lord, we know that you'll do all things in your time according to your will. And we know that. And sometimes we're impatient and we don't want to wait on you. But Lord, today we're here waiting, waiting for your answer. We're also here waiting for your return because we know that you're soon to come. Lord, continue to strengthen us and guide us. Continue to teach us your word. Continue to help us to understand what we must do in these last and evil days. Also, Lord, equip us for the community that we may show them that you, they are also your children and that they also need to be in your house of worship because you want them to come home also with the rest of the saints. Lord, we're just so thankful for you what you have done because you've been better to us than we've been to ourselves. Lord, but you continue to love us in spite of our imperfections. Lord, we know that you have given us grace because, Lord, sometimes we continue to go backwards instead of moving forward. Well, Lord, we ask you to continue to keep guiding us, keep our eyes upon Jesus because we know that he's our light and our guide. Lord, we so thank you for our country, but, Lord, we see it crumbling from every direction. We ask you to pray for our leaders we ask you to give them the knowledge and the wisdom that they need to understand that it is your world, not theirs, and that you can help them to, to make the right decisions. Lord, we're just so thankful for all the visitors today as well, and we thank you for our members who are not here. Lord, strengthen them and comfort them as well, touching their hearts and letting them know that this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us come together and rejoice in it. We're just so thankful for all of that. In Jesus' name, amen. Scripture reads in Proverbs 14, 12. There is a way which seemeth right unto man, but the end therefore thereof are the ways of death. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. this 
world back to God. Have you lost the love? Do you feel like giving up? Has your heart been broken? Are your kids okay? Will they come home safe? Do you lie there hoping? You can make a wish You can knock on wood But we won't do no good You gotta get down on your knees Believe, hold your hands and beg and please You gotta keep on Good morning again. Good morning. Just a beautiful day, isn't it? Amen. Well, uh, I did forget to mention two things. First of all, I have kept pushing that my pumpkins would make very good pies, cookies, and breads. And they're still here. But, so evidently I'm not very convincing, although I have to admit Anna did take one with her and made me a pie. So thank you, Miss Anna. Even if it's just one person, I, got, I did get across to that one person. So see, the Holy Spirit does work. But even if you're not going to make me a pie, please take them because they, uh, they probably won't last much longer. So when we take them off the platform, cook them, and at least feed your family with them. And then uh, the second thing is, speaking of food, I forgot to mention that I, I want you to know how great of a job, Jackie, and... You know, Carolyn and Lois and them are doing at that food uh, pantry. They have done an amazing job. And if you look in there, you would think it's a department store at this point. It's that good. So in two weeks, not this Tuesday, but next Tuesday, because we're going to put up the blinds and stuff for them this uh, Wednesday. But I, I want to I do a ribbon cutting <laughs> session. You know, open it up and dedicate that place properly. And uh, we're going to do that next Wednesday or a week from this Wednesday. So about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. How's that? And uh, we'll do a nice article for the record as well. But those ladies have done a fantastic job at that. So I just wanted everybody to know that. Well, it's a beautiful day, isn't it? A little windy, a little chilly, but it's nice. And it, but if you've been over here with us for the past week, you see we've cut a, covered a lot of false doctrines. 
You know, we, we've covered everything from the once saved, always saved, the rapture. Uh, we've asked questions about the judgment. We've asked questions about, well, are we alive when we're dead? But all these things, we've shown that, that, that mainstream Christianity believe aren't necessarily true. And that we have to go back to the scriptures and ensure what we're teaching and what we're, what we're preaching is true. So please understand, I truly believe that these people are sincere Christians. And the problem is not with their sincerity at all. The fact is, you know, we, we've grown up in a culture that is getting all of our Bible knowledge from the wrong places, such as books and movies and, well, even, let's be honest, even some deceptive preachers out there that are more interested about filling their churches and seeing how much money they can collect than getting people to heaven. But this is why it's so important for all of us to go home every night and study and, and, and ensure that what we're hearing is true. You know, our job up here is not so much to tell you exactly well, we're going to tell you what the Bible teaches, but I, I hope that you go back and, and you study it and you test us. You know, we, we're here to inspire you to study your Bible, not to tell you just outright what you should believe. But, well, I, I think that we have to get to the point that we understand that we need to study our Bibles as if our life depends upon it. Because, my friends, it does. But today, I, I want to look at the book of Titus. And, and, well, we're going to look at the main themes that we find, that we're going to find that the main things that we studied over the past week, well, is the reason most people, the things that we studied this past week, we're going to find that, well, it's the reason that the, most people believe these false doctrine it's because they're living their lives the way they want to. So with this Titus, in these first few verses, what we're going to find is that I truly believe Paul addresses some of this. We, we need to learn to cultivate with, with good materials, with the scriptures itself, with the individuals that are in our lives as well, too. And then we need to ensure that we stay focused on him. You know, I, I want to start with Jeremiah, though, first of all. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. Because I truly believe this is, uh, this, is the, this is the type of passion that we should have to have for the scriptures and for God. Because he says, for I know the thoughts I have toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and hope. And what I'm saying is that we need to have this same type of passion for him. I mean, he has so much passion for us that all he wants is that we have a future and a hope. <coughs> See, during these dark spiritual times, instead of Christians turning to God for comfort, too many times we turn back to our old sinful ways. We find it easier to, to grasp the sinful natures rather than turn to Christ. And we allow our worldly philosophies to find a, find a home in our hearts. And as a result, we find that Christ's name becomes stained. And even the testimony of, of, of believers become worthless if, if we're not living the life that God asks us to live. Over in Proverbs 14, verse 12, here's what we see. It says, There is a way that seems right to man, but it ends, but it ends in the way of death. Beloved, we cannot turn, turn our eyes to Jesus. How can we not turn our eyes to him in a time of trouble? I mean, if, if we're, we have to look at it on both sides, don't we? I mean, we literally have to, have to look at him during the times of good and in the times of trouble as well. But this is exact kind of situation I think that the Apostle Paul wrote about 2,000 years ago to young, young Titus. He writes a very pointed letter to his young disciple and, 
Paul is communicating with Titus that how, how to live in a godly world or how to, live a go how to live a godly life in an ungodly world. See, the idea is that truth must live in every part of our lives. Or it's not really believing, is it? Unless we download Christ into our hearts and we, we, we live it in our lives, I mean, what shows forth in our lives will be worthless deeds. Our actions must show, and our actions will show what our true belief is. It's not enough to just talk about our faith. It must impact and change every, every part of our lives. God has to show up in our churches, in our homes, and in the community that we're working in. So what we find in the book of Titus is that, well, that Paul sets the tone for this letter in just a few opening verses. And over in Titus 1, verse 1 through 4, here's what it says. Paul, a bondservant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness. It says, in hope of eternal life, which God, who we cannot, uh, cannot lie, promised before time began, but as in due time manifested his word through preaching, which was communicated to me according to the commandment of God our Savior, to Titus, a true son in our common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God, from God the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. See, I, I, in these opening verses, Paul makes an appeal for truth, I think. You know, because he says only when we live God's truth are we truly happy. But sadly, truth falls, well, it seems to fall in hard times today. You know, one of the greatest temptations our church faces today is the withering down of the truth. To, to accommodate the culture, or even uh, to accommodate our own personal desires. But here Paul is saying what we should do. He says that, well, you're not to live the life, the church should not live a life the way it wants, it should live the way God wants us to live. And he says we are to, to live radically and not live a, a lazy life. And it begins by standing for the truth. So in other words, standing for Christ. So what I, what I want to do is, is, is I hope that we'll look together with the time that we have and look at these few verses and download them into our lives and that, well, so that we can stand for the truth, especially when times get hard. Now, I, I really found four points that... We're going uh, that I found four points in here that really should impact our lives and make us safe. And well, it'll help us to stand for the truth, especially during those hard times. So the first thing I, I realized from Paul's letter here was that we need to know who we are. See, the subject matter is one of identity at the first part of here. And more specifically, our identity in Christ. You know, at the very core of Paul, well, of Paul's being, he understood who he was. He could have said, Paul, the brilliant scholar. He could have said, Paul, the highly educated Jewish leader. He could have even have said, Paul, the Roman citizen. He could have said of all these things, but he didn't say that. Actually, Paul says... A servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. I mean, this word servant doesn't really grasp this meaning. Because this word here that Paul is using, well, was a word that meant the lowest possible person in society. And it describes a person who literally gives their will over to another person. So Paul was, was saying that he had come to a place that he had just literally humbled himself so deeply 
is so deeply before God that he totally surrendered his life and will over to Christ. He had come to be a servant of God. So, but not only did he submit his, his self to God and, and committed the work to, the, to Jesus until the very end. Well, we see that, that Paul was becoming an apostle of Christ. And he says that was his very vocation. He said that was his only job, or at least his main job. But even more than that, he said that was his life. See, that's what Christ had, had called him to do, and that was, that's what Paul was going to do, no matter what the cost was. See, the power of Paul's life is the thing that made it possible, made it possible for him to take a stand for the truth, even when times were tough for him. Because he said he was a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. See, this does bring us back to our question, who are we? I mean, who are you? Have you come to the place in your life where you have, have totally surrendered it to Jesus? To do whatever he's asked you to do and submitted yourself to his plans for your life? It's a tough question to ask. Because if we're not doing that, we're just going through the motions. Because until we get to this point, we will never truly be able to stand for the truth. All right, and another part I found that I thought was very important is that we must know who we're standing for as well. You know, it, it, it's what this week was really all about. Understanding God's truth. And not only God's truth, but understanding that God's truth was absolute. See, according to the end of, the one, uh, of verse 1, it says, According to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of truth which accords with godliness. And over in verse 2, it moved in and said, A hope of eternal life which God, who cannot lie, promised before the beginning of time. See, the word faith here, well, Paul uses his faith here to, in reference to, to the body of truth, even to the doctrine which he lived by. This was the very thing that he would die for. The things that he would stand, that we should stand for as followers of Christ. See, these are the things that he's talking about. He says, you've got to stand for the truth. And, and if you're going to be able to stand for the truth, you're going to have to know what you believe. See, it's not just head knowledge, but a knowledge that leads to godliness. A knowledge that leads to a change of life. Beloved, do we know what we stand for? But Paul goes on and well, he says that this faith and knowledge results in a hope of an eternal life. He says that's a promise that Christ has given us. He says, I don't, I, I don't, know, I don't know about you, but I'm not sure what 2018 is going to hold for us. But I do know what's in our future. That if we stand for Christ, that when all is said and done, we will be able to say, I'm with Christ. And, and knowing this enables us to stand for the truth, even in a godless world. You say, how can we know this for sure, though? Well, I think the reason is right there in the text. It says, because God cannot lie. I mean, he promised it before the beginning of time. I mean, think about it. Isn't it great that God cannot lie? I mean, he just can't do it. So I'm telling you, it's the one thing he can't do, right? He's never tried. 
I'm not interested. See, his concept doesn't even square with the holy and righteousness of God himself. Everything God has said is 100% true. And, and everything in this book we have to take is 100% truth. But not just truth, but absolute truth. And, and if God's promise of eternal life is, is, a, is a promise that he's made to us, then we have to believe that it's available if we stand for him. You can take the promise to the... It's literally you can take the promise to the bank. And then stand for truth's sake because we know that if we live the life he's asked us to, he will stand with us. I mean, literally, what is the worst thing that could possibly happen to you? I mean, especially in this country, right? But what is the worst thing that could happen? We could lose our life, right? But here's the thing. We can lose our life for our faith. You can lose your life for Christ, but then what? Is it really so terrible? Because the next thing that's going to happen is on that great day of his return, he's going to take you home. And then he'll be able to say, well done, good and faithful servant. I mean, I think that's why Paul says in Philippians 1, verse 21, he says, for to me, to live is Christ. And to die is gain. So he's saying, as long as I have breath, I'm going to give him everything that I've got. And I'm going to stand up for him and the truth that he has. But before you can stand for the truth, you need to know what you believe. I mean, it's nice that we all come to Sabbath services, but... How many of us come to our Bible studies on Wednesday nights? Or go home in the evening and study your Bible or the first thing when you open up? I'm not telling you you have to sit down for hours a day. Just open up a scripture. Read over it five minutes. And then contemplate on that piece of scripture for the rest of the day. Beloved, if we don't understand what we believe, then we're going to be open to be deceived on a lot of those doctrines we talked about this week. But Matthew 24, verse 24. It says, For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. When we read the Bible and, and we learn, it, it, it strengthens us to stand for the truth. And without doing so, I don't believe we have any ability to stand strong, especially in the times of trouble. So this one I thought was very important. Because I think we must know what to do as well. See, what is our mission? You know, once we, once we know what we believe, or who we are and what we believe, and what we stand for, you need to figure out what to do with it. Now notice in verse 3. It says, but as, but as in due time manifested his word through preaching, which was committed to me according to the commandment of God our Savior. See, we must know what our mission is. And Paul certainly knew what his was, didn't he? His mission was to take well, to take the truth which harmonizes with God in us and preach it to the sinners and to all the people of the world that he knew. You know, who needed to know about Jesus Christ. Paul saw the gospel as, as a precious possession that was given to him to share, and he was fired up about it. It really reminded me of uh, Jeremiah 20, verse 9. Because then I, then I said, well, I'm not going to make mention of him nor speak of him anymore in his name. But what does Jeremiah say? It's the second half here. He says, 
but his word was in my heart like a burning fire, shut up in my bones, and I was weary of holding it back. I could not. Believe it, beloved, this is the life and the power that we must feel in our hearts when we think about Christ. We must, it must burn in our bones so, so deeply that we cannot hold it back. Now, I, and I know that it seems like, you know, especially for Jeremiah and Paul, they're referencing their, from their perspective. You know, that, they're, that, that they have such a, a strong passion for Christ that they must get up on the pulpit and preach it to the world. But I think we need to, lead, to, to lose that thought process. Because we need to get rid of that idea because this verse really, I, I don't believe it's speaking about them so much as it is all of us. We need to all proclaim the good news. We need all to herald the message that Christ has given us. And, it, and they're telling us that we must do it with a loud voice. And as a matter of fact, Paul says here in verse 3, that we're literally commanded by God himself to proclaim the good news of the gospel. And so the question comes, are we fired up about <coughs> proclaiming the gospel of Christ? Especially to those who don't know it. Are we really, are, are we really fired up? You know, I think I think this is where Christians fail the most in this area. You know, we come up with so many excuses not to be fired up and not to spread his message. I mean, just a couple of things we, we like to say is that it's not my gift. Yeah, I mean, it, I'm introverted and I really don't like going out and talking to people. Or I, I, I think that if I live a good Christian life before people, well, they'll get the idea of it. truth is that these are just great, nothing more than just cop-outs. We all have shortcomings, but we're expected to overcome those shortcomings. Because Christ is told, well, we're told that we can do what? All things through Christ? Who's strengthening me? Beloved, we, we are commanded to proclaim the gospel to the entire world around us. I don't believe it's an option. I, I don't believe it's just when I feel like it. And I don't even believe that it's just when it's convenient for us. Because I truly believe there's an urgency to this message. And when we don't take, when we don't take it as a commandment and, and, and have that passion for it, we not only hurt those around us, but we can hurt ourselves as well. We've got to be strong enough to stand for the truth. So, we must know what our mission is. But our last point here is found in verse 4. It says, To Titus, a true son, in our common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So the, so the last thing we must know is that I must know who I'm doing it for. So Paul is writing this young man in ministry who was, who was under his authority and his care. And he calls him his true son. Probably because he led Titus to, uh, to Christ. But definitely because he was discipling him, wasn't he? But here's the thing. Paul knew who his people were. Do we know who our people are? I mean, God has called us to be an influence to somebody, our family members, our friends, our people in our church, or many times the strangers out in our community. But, but we need to know who those people are. See, I, I can't do much about the world we live in. 
But, but I can't help those people that are right there in my sphere of influence, right? See, I believe with all my heart that this coming year is going to be a fantastic year for our church. We're, 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 we're going to see God do stuff that in our church that we have never seen before. And I'm not just talking about projects that, that we'll work on to improve our church, but more importantly, the things that we're going to do outside the church. You know, simple things like caroling and handing out little, little gifts to the, the community. Having a drive through prayer program set up out there maybe once a quarter. So people can literally drive up, sit in their cars, and we can pray with them. You know, the, the BBS program, the, the health ministry. I'm telling you, I'm so excited about their health ministry because we got a call and we were asked to, well, we were given two dates. Does everybody know what the Jump Start program is? Or the Jump Start? It's kind of like the Pathway to Health, but a much smaller version of it. They have asked us to host one here in Amarillo. Now, they gave us May of next year, or May of 2019. We chose 2019. Because it takes a long time to set up for a program like that. But I'm truly excited about the things that are going to happen this year. And especially with the focus on our, on our young adults. So I truly believe that we will see God work in our church like he's never done before. It's going to be a great year. I truly believe that. But Titus, well, Titus was Paul's problem. And I, and I don't know Titus, but like I said, our focus, our focus needs to be on our families, our friends, our church. And that's our place to stay focused on. But especially out there in the community. Especially the way the world is getting today. We need to find each and every one of those that are truly needing help and accepting help and bring them home. See, that's where we can do something for Christ. So let's just ask you this. What is your plan for 2018? I hope it's to get involved and get involved in spreading the message of Christ. Because there's going to be a day, my friends, we have to stand for the truth. And I truly believe that God has put each and, one, each and every one of us here right now so that we can do his work. The only question is, are we doing his work or are we going to do his work? Because, because you've got to know who you're working for. And, and we have to be willing to surrender to him. Before we know it, life, will, well, life is going to be gone. You know, we've read the passages and... We've got a good understanding of what they mean, but all that remains is that we make a choice. A choice to, to live out our identity as followers of Christ. A choice to stand for that truth, even in the face of opposition. To do the things that God has called us to do. You know, to, to recommit to, to be a people of God and serve him as he has asked us to. That's what's in Titus 1, verses 1 through 4. He's telling us that we need to take a stand for the truth in a world that so desperately needs it. Because, well, before you know it, like I say, life moves on. So we have a choice. A choice to live out of live out my identity as a follower, like I said, or, or stand for what I believe, even in the face of opposition, to, to do the things that call, God has called us to do. And like I said, to, recom to recommit to, the, to be a people of God. It, it's, a, it's a beautiful life that we have here. I mean, God has, has blessed us such a, with, with a great family, a great church, 
and even a community to work with them. The only question, are we willing to do that? Are we really willing to stand for him? And then to, to take up the armor, to take the sword out in the community and tell them the truth as well. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for you and the chance to, to be here and the chance to, Lord, just the chance to study your word and know your truths. And Lord, we just ask that you be with each and every one of us to, to help us to, to stand for you. And not just in the times of good, Lord, but in the times of trouble as well. To be able to step out of these doors this year, Lord, and, and, and look forward to, to spreading your message in whatever we do. But Lord, just help us to, uh, to put these things in our hearts, Lord, to be committed to them. And most of all, help us to be committed to you. But we truly love you, Lord, and we just pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand for our closing song. I know our kids are around here somewhere. time I sang a song, Gary was up here with me. I swear he put 24 powers in that one little three words. Yeah, it was amazing. But let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, again, we're just truly grateful for you. We're truly grateful that you're here with us. And Lord, we just ask that you be with those that weren't able to be here, Lord. To truly uh, touch them in, in their health or in their hearts, whichever applied, Lord. But Lord, especially touch our hearts to never let us forget to to come to you and to work as you ask us to. But Lord, we're just truly grateful for you and we love you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I have two things, potluck. And I'm going to put on a video for you. It's a three and a half minute video if they switch me back over. And it's going to, it's an interview. It's a three and a half inter minute interview with a gentleman who made the documentary that we're going to watch this afternoon. It was quite interesting. Oh, I've got to turn on my clicker. There it goes.
We have audio. Oh, we don't have audio because I didn't turn it on. Don't worry about it. Sorry. Okay. I forgot to plug in my mic. 